And what I wanted to talk about are basically four aspects of, of new game development evaluation. First, having to do with the idea, then thinking about the viability of the new game project, how would you validate a new game concept, and then thinking about execution. And so what I wanted to do is actually just talk about a few specific concepts associated with each of those areas. And it's gonna be a little bit high level, but I think these are concepts that I personally believe are important to understand if you really wanna optimize new game development and understanding how you would evaluate and again, optimize the new game development process. And um, I thought this might be a good topic to, to think about, especially in the context of India, just because you know, India historically has had a lot of experience in terms of live ops, content, cadence, execution, but um, not as much, and I know this is starting to happen now, but not as much in terms of new game development. Okay, so a little bit more about myself. So I am currently the CEO of Leela Games. We're a FPS shooter game company situated in Bangalore, India. I also write a newsletter, the Game Makers newsletter on Substack. Uh, if any of you guys are interested in learning more about uh, free-to-play game development, please sign up. But uh, pr previous to Leela, I've had a career working at NBC Universal, Sega, Fun Plus, and uh, very early on, uh, I started a company called Playviews. Okay, so again, just to kind of frame the conversation for today, I want to talk about a, a few concepts in each of these areas in terms of um, how do you think about the idea for a new game, how you would think about the viability, validation, and then execution. So I wanted to first start with the idea. And I want to talk about two concepts res with respect to um, new game development ideas. And by first talking about trying to understand the kind of opportunity that you're going for. And so when it comes to the game idea itself, you know, I generally like to think about new game projects in terms of these three categories. They're either what I would call a plus one type of game concept, an adaptation, or Brave New World. And what a plus one concept is, is basically where you take an existing game that has some level of product market fit and traction in the market, and you wanna add some bit of innovation. Now, depending on who you speak with, that may be 10%, 20%, 30%, but basically adding a little bit of innovation so that you're not gonna go too far away from hitting product market fit and you're not changing the game too much. The second is an adaptation, meaning you're taking an existing game and you're trying to adapt it oftentimes from one platform to another. And then the third is what I call Brave New World, just meaning that you're trying to make a game that is not as similar as a lot of other existing games on the market. It might be riskier because it's like a bold new idea, but it's basically more of a quantum leap from existing games in, in terms of the design and the ambitiousness of the design. So I'll just walk through a few examples. So an example of a plus one would be a game like Star Wars Galaxy of Heroes. And I also wanted to just, um, underneath this umbrella of plus one games, also want to highlight that uh, one way in which a lot of games companies think about how do you do a plus one is by thinking about the game in terms of the gameplay and then the systems design, right, or the meta. And the Japanese have really pioneered this approach of what they call the kind of like the DNA game strategy, meaning one way you can think about coming up with a new game idea is to take the gameplay from one game and mix it with the systems of another. And so if you're taking a specific type of gameplay model and mixing it with whether it's, you know, Battle Pass or uh, like RPG mechanics or Gotcha Fusion or, you know, different kind of system, you can mix and match these things in different combinations. Um, and that's essentially called the sort of the DNA approach. But a plus one game design is basically one in which you're adding a little bit of extra innovation but not too much. I think when we look at the games that have done extremely well, um, for whatever reason, I would say that the type of new game development that has done um, better than, than many others is this notion of game adaptations. And we've seen this happen over and over in the industry um, from, from the past and today. So for example, Supercell's Clash of Clans was essentially an existing game. It was Backyard Monsters on Facebook. And Supercell did a great job of adapting that game to be more mobile specific, they you know, simplified the resources, they tightened up the core loop and things like that, but they basically took an existing proven game and they adapted it to a new platform. 
very similar with um, Warcraft 3 Defense of the Ancients. They took a mod and they made the mod more accessible and, uh, to a wider audience. They included a tutorial. They really made it a, a lot friendlier. And so that was sort of like the, the adaptation there. And then um, very popular, I, kn I know that PUBG is very popular here, but you know, um, the, the notion of Battle Royale existed. It was a mod, King of the, the Kill mod in H1Z1, and that was kind of adapted uh, to create uh, PUBG. And finally, like Brave New World um, ideas are often viewed as riskier, but they're basically quantum leaps in terms of design. So whether it's Dota Legends, Plants vs. Zombies, Diablo, or Warcraft, now, many of these games often do have a basis in some other type of game. So Plants vs. Zombies, you can argue, is kind of like a, a riff of tower defense, but you know, I feel that they have done so much, they have done enough that it basically warrants um, being described as a quantum leap from previous game types. So the reason why I think it's important to understand the kind of game that you're, the, the kind of uh, idea that you're working on is to understand the context in which you are operating in the competitive landscape. And so when you think about, for example, if we were to map these three different kinds of game ideas based upon, like on the y-axis, degree of market differentiation versus the x-axis, which is the degree of proven product market fit, then we would basically um, map those three different game ideas in this way. And I think um, one of the things to note is that Larger companies are often better at the plus ones, right? Meaning like you're taking something existing, you're making a small improvement, and then you're working on that game. And then oftentimes, uh, Brave New World types of game designs, because they're so radical, because you have to make a lot of changes, because you have to do a lot of iteration, um, that usually favors the smaller, nimbler companies. So like that favors new entrants. But I, I think the other way to think about this is like, thinking about the overall environment in which you're competing as well, because there are gonna be times when uh, a rush of competitors flood the market. And so for a given genre, let's say match three, if there's a lot of competition there, you're probably gonna want to look for more brave new world type of ideas, more differentiation. And if there aren't a lot, and if you are coming with big IP or other things like that, then you want to shift to a plus one, for example. So, I, so that's the concept of understanding the kind of game idea that you're working on. But the other thing I wanted to talk about is the notion of a secret. And so for any of you who have read the book um, Zero to One from Peter Thiel, he talks about how every great business is built around a secret that's hidden from the outside. And so what does he mean by secret? Well, what he means by secret is he thinks that there are different kinds of ideas, right? There are conventions, meaning it's easy. Everyone understands what a convention is. There are secrets which are hard, and then there are mysteries which are impossible. But the point here being is that if, if you think about um, the kind of idea that you're working on for a game, that oftentimes the ones that are gonna become the big hits aren't gonna be the ones where it's easy to see. If everyone understands a game idea is good, a lot of people are gonna do that, right? So it's the game ideas that are going against convention where most people are like, oh, this is a stupid idea, why would you do that, right? If you know that secret and the rest of the industry doesn't, that's when you have the big hits. And so, for example, you know, it wasn't obvious that you can monetize cosmetics in Western markets before. And so when you know, Fortnite released Battle Pass, that was actually kind of surprising, that was a secret. Um, it used to be that when Match 3 was first uh, first kind of um, becoming popular, it was the big, it started to become the biggest genre with the highest growth and it was, it was like easy to see this is a market that at least big companies should enter. And then it got flooded. Then the secret then became with all this competition and with all the match three games, the secret was that you could still compete and so Dream Games was able to compete even though the common wisdom was that it was difficult to compete at that time. So um, there's a venture capitalist by the name of Andrew Chen, and he basically characterized this issue of a secret in, in the following way that you can see in this slide. So if an idea sounds smart and has no traction, well, then it's kind of a dumb idea, right? Um, if, if it sounds smart and has traction, great. 
you have no traction and sounds dumb, and that's just kind of stupid all around. But if it sounds dumb and has traction, that's where you get the big hits, right? So this is very similar to like if we look outside of gaming at companies like eBay. You know, when eBay first came, a lot of people were like, oh, this is stupid. So you're telling me that I'm going to buy some, something from a random stranger and just reputation is going to allow this ecosystem to develop? That sounds absolutely stupid. Or Uber, you mean to tell me I'm going to jump into a car with a stranger and just trust that that person is going to take me to the right place? So again, it's, it's these ideas that are against convention that sound dumb but then eventually get traction that oftentimes become the biggest hits. So um, the point I want to make here is really think about, so, so then why is it difficult to work on these secrets, right? And, and I, I think um, a few points to kind of highlight here is, first of all, secrets are hard, right? Meaning that if you're working on a secret, it's usually not the easy thing. It's going to require a lot of effort, a lot of resources, a lot of energy. Also, in terms of the investment environment, they're often undercapitalized. Like, secrets by their very nature, because they sound dumb, are going to be difficult to get support and to get resources for. Third is just like financial and business planning. Um, a lot of corporate executives and sort of the bean counter types that you find at big companies are going to want a highly structured and planned business process that oftentimes does not necessarily fit when you're trying to develop something that is considered a secret. And finally, it's just lack of understanding. Like um, a lot of executives may not understand that some of these stupid sounding game ideas actually can become good hits and how to actually manage against trying to develop one of these ideas that may not, you know, that sounds kind of dumb. All right, so that was the first part, talking about the idea. And just in, to recap, I talked about different kinds of ideas and trying to understand the environment in which you're operating in. Also talked about the other concept around knowing a secret and how some of the biggest game ideas may actually be secrets, meaning a lot of people think that it's not a good idea. The second uh, area I wanted to talk about is viability. And so, um, one of the ways in which I try to think about whether a new game idea is viable or a new game opportunity is viable for a company or not is by trying to look at the overlap of these three areas. First, in terms of the market. So if we make this game, what is the potential? Right? Like, and uh, this, the type of analysis you'll do depends on whether it's in an existing a genre that's well characterized or if it's going to be something completely new, but trying to understand the trends, trying to determine what the potential market size and the growth for this new type of game is, is going to be, is the market aspect of the viability. The second is in terms of competency, the, the lower left-hand corner bubble, and that's really about, well, even if a, a new game idea is good or it, you think you have a strong belief in it, is your team the right team to be able to execute on that idea? And so competency really goes, speaks to the strengths of your team, the, strength, the strengths of the, of the key people in your game studio, and whether you have any unique capabilities, and whether you have the depth in this genre to deliver a, a hit game. And finally is desire. So even if you may lack some competency, maybe you may not be the best in the world, but if you really, really love this genre or the game idea that your team is willing to put in enough energy and effort to sort of catch up, and, and so if there's strong desire, if there is um, high competency, and if there is a strong market, that's usually the kind of the, the confluence of factors that would then indicate that you have a viable business idea. And so, in the next set of slides, I want to now talk a little bit about how you would characterize the market. I think talking about competency and desire, a little bit out of the scope of this presentation, but let me just give you a few quick um, tips in terms of how you would characterize the market. In general, I, I think you don't need to do like a whole lot of, um, I mean, I, I, in, to some degree, the more sophisticated and complicated the analysis that you do, sometimes it actually can be worse than very simple types of analysis. But in this case, just taking a, an example, let's say, and this is you know, just a dumb idea that I thought about um, uh, yesterday, but um, let's say we wanted to make a, uh, you know, I'm a big fan of Clash Royale, I love the Hog Rider, 
but let's say we wanted to make a hog rider racing game. Then one of the things that you probably want to do is to then think about, okay, well, for this game, what would be comparable games? And so what you want to do is you want to use a service like data.ai or sensor tower or something like that to then look at what is possible from a downloads and revenue perspective. And then what is the potential monetization when you look at the revenue per download? How well can you monetize against that space? And again, you're not looking for perfect answers, but you want to try and get a sense of what is possible if we were to make this kind of a game. And from there, what you then want to do is you want to make some adjustments to that analysis, right? And then you want to try to develop some scenario modeling around, well, if we were to make this game, you know, we could, it, it, we, we know that other games have a certain range of downloads, a certain range of LTV. And so then for you to think about, well, for our game, this Hog Rider game maybe has a little bit better monetization or you've added additional monetization metrics. So you believe that the LTV could potentially be higher. Or because we're using, you know, Supercell IP, although I'm sure they would never agree to it, um, then that means that you get more downloads. But then there might be a rev share. But then to, like, do this kind of very basic, simple modeling, just to give you a rough idea. If we were to invest resources into this game, then, you know, what, is, what are the potential outcomes that we're looking at? Just to make sure that if you did invest in this, that... Um, in the end, that your company can make money and be profitable on this game. I think the, um, the third type of market viability analysis that you can do is something around building a monetization table. Um, so whether it's based upon ARPDAO or LTV contribution, what you want to try to do is to think about, so when, when you first look at revenues and downloads of comparable games, you're looking externally, right? You're looking at games on the market externally and trying to determine how well the game can do by taking an external perspective. But then in this analysis, what you're trying to do is you're trying to look at the game itself. This is the internal perspective. And you're trying to think about, well, for our game, here are all the different ways in which the game could potentially monetize. And then you want to try to, and again, it's, it's not, the, the purpose of this exercise is not to be perfect, but to just get a sense of if we were to add these monetization mechanics, you know, what are we expecting from each of the sources of monetization and what's possible if we were to actually uh, deliver this game? And the fourth thing is just, um, you know, IP is very popular these days, but like um, if you're, whether it's like the type of game that you're working on or whether if, if it's IP based or things like that, you know, just use other data sources, whether it's Google Trends or whatever, just to give you a rough sense of if we were to do this game, so let, let's say we, we were going to do, you know, um, a Marvel game you can, relative to a Star Wars game, you can look at other games that might have been similar that have launched, and you can, you know, using these data points by rough approximation, try to adjust what your thinking is in terms of, well, if I launch a certain kind of IP-based game, how well would that do? Okay, the third area I want to talk about is validation. And so from a validation perspective, I typically see kind of four ways of thinking about how you would validate whether um, a new game will be successful or not. And the first is something I just call internal, meaning you're focusing on the creator's intuition. That, you know, you're making, you're making a game for me or you're, you're that somebody within the company has the sense of what makes a good game and you're relying on that internal perspective as more of an influencer, expert, or something like that to help drive the product vision, the game vision, right? And so if you have, uh, in the consumer electronics market, right, Steve Jobs was known to be a master at this, basically understanding what people want. And so there's the internal perspective Second is a market perspective, meaning you're going to look at other games, you're going to try to deconstruct parts of those games, you're going to try to see um, what, in, what about those other games that, are, that have traction in the market is similar to your game and try to extrapolate from there. The third, which I think is um, the most popular, is more of an audience-based validation. And what that means is that um, you would take your idea and you would take it to focus groups or to players and get a lot of feedback through Discord groups or things like that. And the fourth is something I just call human psyche, meaning when you're developing mechanics and games, you're trying to really think about what kind of 
latent human desire the, the game or the features are satisfying. And so it's, um, it's really trying to think about the psychology of the game and trying to understand if you were to tap into uh, those various latent human desires, how well, how well the game would do if you were to be successful. And I think if we were to compare a couple of companies with different kinds of primary approaches, and again, I haven't, um, so I, I know a lot of people at Blizzard and Riot, and so this is just my perspective in terms of the differences between these two companies, just based upon conversations I've had with current and uh, former employees of those companies. But, um, you know, I guess what I want to try to highlight with this slide is that there is no one right approach or answer. But I would say that if I were to try to characterize differences between these two companies, which who are both, you know, I'm a huge fan of both companies and think they're awesome, that Blizzard tends to be, in my opinion, um, that the games that they develop are generally based upon them thinking of themselves as the experts, the influencers, and, well, I'll step away from there, um, and trying to make games that if they feel that they like, that other people will like and will become popular. Riot is very famous for being um, player oriented. Uh, one of their values is players, player experience first. And many of the folks um, who I know from Riot or formerly at Riot generally do take this approach of like even before you start on the game of talking to a lot of different players, a lot of different influencers and getting their feedback before and having the player feedback drive what the game should look like. And based upon these approaches, I would say that if you're taking the Blizzard approach, one of the um, advantages is I believe that because you're, you're focusing more on what you think would be great, that helps allow you to, to I think, seek more innovative types of ideas versus, um, I think, the, the more audience-based approach or the player approach. Uh, oftentimes, the kind of feedback that you get would help um, refine a specific idea, but harder to like really push for something big, new, dramatic, more like the brave new world type of, of ideas I think are harder using this type of approach. Okay, and then in terms of validation, I think the other thing to think about would be um, thinking about players from a persona's perspective. And so um, there's, there's sort of like validation that you do as I mentioned before, in terms of those four different areas. But then I think the other thing that happens, and this is just a, you know, Activision Blizzard uh, published persona types. And so I, I don't think you should necessarily use these, but like for your game, if you had a number of different personas, the, the other thing that a lot of game designers think about is like when you are designing for a new game concept, how do you choose which features to include? And one way you could do it is like if you were to characterize the personas in your game, and you have a target persona, then you say, for this feature, does this feature actually fit for this persona or not? And that would be one way of validating whether specific features or mechanics actually should go into the game or not. All right, and finally, the last area is execution. And, um, uh, okay, so there are three concepts that I just wanna cover really quickly. Trying to do a quick check on my time here as well. Um, so when it comes to execution, I think three concepts I'd like you to take away is one, very important concept. I also talked about this at, at, here at IGDC in 2019, but this notion of zero to one, basically the difference between new game development and live ops. Second is the importance of focusing on key risks. And finally, this notion of different kinds of of artists or different kinds of creators. If you think about game development as an artistic form, then you, I think it's very important to understand the kind of creators, the kind of developer that you are, because that will then impact how you actually um, structure your product roadmap and how you, um, how you approach game development. So I'll explain, that. I'll explain that in the coming slides, but let me start with zero to one. I don't know if any of you guys follow my content, but if you do, I've spoken on this concept um, a lot over the last four or five years, but um, Peter Thiel in his book, Zero to One, um, basically characterizes uh, this concept in the following way. Doing what we already know how to do takes the world from one to N, adding more of something familiar. 
But every time we recreate something new, we go from zero to one. The act of creation is singular, as is the moment of creation, and the result is something fresh and strange. So the point being that new game development is like trying to create a quantum leap in something, right? You're, you're, you're creating something new. Um, one to N is scaling. So, you know, once you've launched a game, it's a cheap product market fit, then you can start to scale the game. You can try to expand to different geographies. You can do different things to, you know, help improve the game. But that's more of the one to N aspect. And so the claim I, I want to make here today, and I think the important concept for many of you thinking about if you have a career at Zynga or EA and want to work on a new game, is to understand that the kind of skills that, is, that are required to really make new games is actually very fundamentally different from the one-to-end aspect. And so it's, it's almost like the difference between a hunter and a gatherer. So new game development, if, if we're to take a mathematical example, you're trying to find a big global maximum. Whereas one to end, it's like trying to, it's, it's optimizing against an existing um, maxima that you're already on, right? And so, um, again, I just want to highlight the differences there. And in terms of the skills, there are a lot of differences. Um, so, you know, there's an orientation to be more artistic for new game development versus more scientific for live ops. Um, you know, oftentimes the, the type of thinking that it's required is more about being holistic versus reductionist. And, um, you know, I, I would say the biggest issue is in terms of certainty, the, the last point in that table, which is that sometimes in new game development, you're going to have to have conviction without data. But when you're in live ops, and many, and some of you who are at Zynga will know that, you know, at Zynga it's like, show me the data or just shut up, right? So that's, that's kind of like, um, uh, that's kind of like the, 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 the type of certainty that you should have in these two different kinds of, um, of scenarios. Okay, so uh, that's the zero to one concept. I think the second concept I want to talk about is this notion of risk. And there was a Gama Sutra research, or it was published in Gama Sutra, but there was a research report done where they studied 155 game postmortems from game development and they um, actually published the results. And here was one of the conclusions. Finally, based on our analysis of the data, of the data we collected, we make a few recommendations to game developers. First, be sure to practice good risk management techniques. This will help avoid some of the adverse effects of obstacles that you may encounter during development. Second, prescribe to an iterative development process and utilize prototypes as a method of proving features and concepts before committing them to design. Third, don't be overly ambitious in your design. So I want to highlight um, a couple of the, uh, the points made in, um, from the conclusion to this research report, which is first the importance of practicing good risk management techniques and then utilizing prototypes. <clears throat> and so this is um, some concepts I took from a GDC talk back in like, when was it, 2006 called advanced prototyping. But part of what I would highly recommend is when you're working on new game development to really focus on you know, what are the biggest risks? And can you make a prototype against those risks to, if not, you know, completely mitigate the risk, to at least characterize the risk? And so, uh, and by prototype, it doesn't have to necessarily be software. It could be a Facebook ad test. It could be um, a mechanic that you've already seen in another game. But it doesn't, again, it doesn't necessarily have to be software that you write. Um, but, uh, I'm running out of time here, so I'm going to kind of speed up a little bit. But I, I think the, the most important thing, in my opinion, is when you're working on a new game to characterize all the key risks and then to think about, well, how do we, how do we try to bring the biggest risks first, work on the biggest risks first, and try to think about what kind of prototypes you can make to try to mitigate or characterize those key risks. Um, and the final point I want to talk about, and is it okay if I run a few minutes over? Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll try, or just cut me off. Okay, so there was, ah, there was a book called Old Masters and Young Geniuses by a guy by the name of David Gallinson. And he basically, the, the whole point of his book was to posit that there are two types of artists. One that he called experimental 
innovators, which are, which are basically like people who iterate a lot, and conceptual innovators, which are basically people who plan more. So uh, I just kind of uh, skipped the last slide uh, just for time, but um, I think this slide characterizes the two kinds of artists pretty well. So Paul Cezanne was a guy who would try to seek in his painting, meaning when he painted, he would draw something, throw it away, draw something with a small change, throw it away, draw something, draw something, draw something, until he finally got the painting that he wanted to. Pablo Picasso, on the other hand, had a very different type of technique in his painting. So he had a notebook, and in his notebook, he would often have almost 300 smaller drawings. He would really plan out what he would want to draw, and then he would draw it once. And this is kind of the archetypal difference between these two different kinds of artists. And what you'll find is that when you look at any kind of art, writing, music, anything like that, you'll find this kind of distinction in those kinds of artists. And just as an example from fiction, it's known that there are two types of writers in fiction. There's a discovery writer, meaning there's somebody who just writes and discovers what the story is as they write and makes iterative changes. And then there's an outliner, meaning there's the type of writer who will write the whole outline for their book first and then start writing. So again, we see these two different types of artists um, in the world. And I, what I submit to you is that this applies to all forms of art, including game design. And uh, just as another example, you know, Michelangelo, um, basically uh, this famous quote from him, I saw the angel in the marble and carved until I set him free. So there is a specific image of what the art is, right? Um, and what we see in the games industry is we see examples of this kind of development as well. And so for a game like Game of War, um, that was more of a planned type of, uh, it was a conceptual innovation. It was, it was basically based upon a very specific design and planned well in advance. Plants vs. Zombies, um, I actually had an opportunity to meet with the two guys who made that game, and they described their game development process as like they started writing something, and then they just would just keep writing, refactoring, writing, refactoring, writing, refactoring, until they got Plants vs. Zombies. So um, the main point I want to make here is that I think it's very important to then think about for the type of artist that you are, or the, for, the, for, the, for the kind of artists that you have in terms of your game studio, to think then about how that would impact your product roadmap, how that would impact your game development execution. And um, what we often see, for example, is that for um, a lot of HD, like console and PC games, that there's usually more of a development process that follows uh, the, the top um, image, meaning that there's like you generally like some type of foundation milestone then there is this iterative approach of working on a vertical slice and you iterate, you iterate, you iterate until you kind of figure out, okay, this is the game. Then you waterfall down versus um, a conceptual, like more of the planned model where you might have more of a features-based roadmap where you've completely planned out what the game looks like. So then there's an alpha with core features, a beta with um, where you're completing the features and then you kind of soft launch and that's where you do your kind of iteration and optimization. So uh, my time's up, uh, but I, I think the main point to realize and what I want you to take away from this is in terms of the execution is to think about for your situation, how can you optimize the game development process itself? All right, that's it. I didn't run too much over. Sorry about that. Um, but just in summary, um, here are the things that we talked about in terms of the idea. I talk, talked about the importance of knowing the type of game idea or concept that you have, the importance of understanding the notion of a secret in terms of viability, um, trying to think about the market plus competency plus desire, that framework, and then also the different types of market analysis that you could do to try and see if the game is market viable. The third area was validation, so I, I d discussed four different validation approaches, but also talked very briefly on persona profiling. And then finally, in terms of execution, please do take away these concepts of zero to one, um, focusing on key risks first and prototyping, 
and then understanding for your artist type how that would potentially affect your game development process. And that's it. Thank you very much. <laughs>